But the first church was Homestead. Yes. And after we started Homestead proper, I would say, this is Shirley, I stayed the course and she has never left my back. She loved the church and she would do anything to help the cause of God. And today, on behalf of Pastor Dr. John Monterey and the leadership team and the church at large, we want to wish you, Sister Shirley, a happy birthday. So we're going to see the birthday song for you. Okay? We're going to see Sister Shirley tomorrow, Tomorrow. So we're going to sing it for her. We're going to present it with something special. It's a special milestone, by the way, but she don't tell her age. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sister Shirley. Happy birthday to you. May the good Lord. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, so Ella Lars is gonna be All right. Um just one more thing that Elder Anthony did not mention, and I think it needs to be mentioned. When the church moved online, Sabbaths and Wednesday nights. The audience consisted of Sister Shirley and somebody else. She was ever present. Yes. Uh, the only time she wasn't there is if she wasn't feeling well or she just could not get on because the link didn't work. That's true. No, it's true. She was always there. Always there. A dedicated member of the church. And Sister Shirley... Um, Beautiful fruit basket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she said it's fruit, not candy. <laughs> and a beautiful art. Please. Let her take a picture with that. Take a picture with that. Let her take a picture. You, you hold it. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Sister Shirley. And, and may you live to see many more birthdays. All right.
I intended to stand uh, on ground floor, but the other Anthony told me I better stand uh, on the higher floor, the platform, because there are so many persons who were in support of this very special service of dedication of an infant. And so we will need more room at the front. So at this time, I call brother and sister Davis to come forward with the heritage of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I would invite the family members to follow them to the platform Amen. because you will be a part of this experience today.
and I know that there are others in the congregation who are supporters of this family of the Davis family and you'd want to join in this celebration also if there are some close friends uh, you may also want to join us to the front I invite you to do so also Come to the center as much as possible so that when uh, Elder Morrison goes to the back of me to take a photograph, he'll be able to see everybody. It is always a very special experience and a joyful one for parents to be able to present a child to the Lord in acknowledgement that the blessing of the child is a blessing from God. Amen. You know, everybody can have children. In fact, mm -mm. many people have children. There are many who do not. And there are many who have children, but yet they abandon them and they leave them in hospital rooms and they Put them on the steps of other people's houses or at the step of a church and i think all of us have read such stories but today sister angie and brother chad davis have come to present this child return this child to the lord in an act of faith acknowledging that this child came about as a result of god's blessing and the Bible says in Psalms 127, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. Then in verse 2 it says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. God gives sleep to his people. Is anybody here who likes to sleep? Is anybody here who enjoy their sleep? I'm telling you, I enjoy my sleep. I don't sit up late worrying about anything. I go to sleep. God gives me sleep. But verse 3 says, Lo, children are the heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward the fruit of the womb is the reward that he gives to those who trust him Amen. and i believe and i have talked with sister angie and i know the testimony is still that god has blessed the family with this child Amen. and today they come to present this infant to the lord returning this child to God, dedicating this child to God and his service. But you know, there are family members standing here. The duty first rests upon the parents to train this child. Yes. But the truth is there are many other persons, family members, acquaintances, who will come in contact with this child and will influence this child. Mama can, mommy can say, Sister Angie would say, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. But then if auntie or uncle comes along and says, don't bother with mommy, you can do it. I can promise you that child is going to believe auntie or uncle. Because auntie or uncle is given license to do what the child wants to do. So the charge here today is not only to the parents to train this child up and bring this child up in the fear and knowledge of the Lord. May I have the church clerk? To bring this child up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so today I charge the parents 
that as you acknowledge that this child is a gift from God, it is your duty to bring this child up in the fear and admonition of the law to the best of your ability with the grace and help of God. Because believe me, in this 21st century, raising children is rough, it's tough, it's difficult. You can teach them one thing at home and you'd be shocked to see that they leave the house and go out and do just the opposite to what they had been taught. By the way, that has been always so. But it's getting worse. So, Chad and Angie, God has blessed you with this child. Now, it is your, an act of faith on your part that you are saying to God, we return this child to you. And you are trusting God to let his divine influence be upon this child. That his angel, whom he has assigned to walk by the light beside this child, will so guide and direct her uh, as she walks and that she would walk in the way of righteousness. And so family members, to you also, God has called you to be a positive influence in the life of this child. Make your commitment today that if for the, if for the influence of anyone, that it be the influence of you, that will lead this child to know Jesus, Amen. to live for Jesus, or when she should reach the age of accountability to give her life to Jesus. Amen. But congregation, children come in contact with many people, maybe the Sabbath school teacher or someone else in the church. You too have an obligation to exert a positive influence in the life of this child. Amen. So Chad and Angie, there is another verse here which says, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. <laughs> so we hope that this is not the last, first and the last time that you'll be dedicating here a child to the Lord. I pray that God will bless you bountifully with more until you say it is full. God be with you. And the child we are dedicating here today, Allison Kaylee Davis. May the Spirit of God anoint this child, Allison, and may she grow up in the knowledge of Christ and with a desire to serve Christ with fullness of heart. I'm still following the health protocol. Amen. <laughs> I told Sister Andre that I want this child to be asleep at this point in this ceremony because I don't want her screaming in my hands. And the Lord Jesus has put her to sleep. Amen. I invite you to bow heads for prayer. Lord Jesus, there is no God like you. No one who is gracious and gives good gifts like you. You gave this gift of this child, Allison Cayley, to brother and sister Davis. Now, Father, we pray that you will be with them, that they may raise this child by precept and example, that they will every day trust you, for your blessings. 
and let them see your hand guiding and directing in the life of this child. Be with the family members and the church members. Help us all to exert the right kind of influence on this child. That this child will grow up loving Jesus. This child will serve Jesus. This child will be a positive example of what it means to be a child of God. And when this child should reach the age, Lord, where she can make that decision, let her make a decision to give her life in Christ through baptism, that she may be washed in the blood, that she may be anointed by your spirit, that she may be an instrument in the hand of God. Bless again, we pray, this family. Surround the family with heavenly angels and let your Holy Spirit abide in the hearts of the father and mother. And let the home in which this child grows up be a place where Jesus Christ is Lord and head of the family. Hear our prayer today. Bless again, we ask. Anoint in a special way, we beseech you with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, um, on behalf of the Homestead SDA Church, I want to welcome Allison. She woke up at when I started to speak. Welcome to the cradle room. Amen? Amen. In Uganda, was built in Nchwanga about 160 kilometers outside of the capital city of Kampala. The ground where I am speaking from is... The first mission station in Uganda was built in Nchwanga, about 160 kilometers outside of the capital city of Kampala. The ground where I am speaking from is called Nchwanga. This place is very historical in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Uganda because our pioneers in the year 1927, in December, they came and camped here. This is where the very first Seventh-day Adventist mission station was established in the country. And from here, our church has grown and has spread to all parts of the country, having been launched from this very ground. After 20 years of working in this territory, missionaries learned that the work was progressing faster near the city of Kampala. So they moved their headquarters from this fertile one square mile of land to a spot near Kampala. Today, the landscape of Uganda might look a little different than it did back then but there are still great mission opportunities. About 80% of the population is under the age of 35, and the median age for the whole country is 16. There is a vibrancy and energy in the population, but there is also the challenge of unemployment. As leaders of this caring church, they see this challenge as a chance to nurture and equip them by implementing Christ's method. A center of influence is being started in Nchwanga, where Adventist work began in the country. We want to establish a discipleship and a livelihood training center. When we bring these young people, we will disciple them, ground them in our values, ground them in the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle. But above all, we also want to integrate livelihood skills so that 
or in addition to being equipped to sharing their faith and participating in the life and the mission of the church, they are also equipped to be self-supporting so that they can go all over the country and witness for Christ, but also share in the skills they will acquire from this very ground in, in, in Inchuanga. At this training center, students will receive hands-on agricultural experience. They will learn how to work with the ground, nurture crops, watch them grow, and enjoy the harvest. The farm is big enough to train and equip many students. This farm is seated on 640 acres of land. That is one square mile. So um, we have uh, projects of uh, banana plantation, pineapple plantation, cocoa plantation, and uh, fish ponds, and also passion fruit plantation. This farm is uh, here as the initiative of Western Uganda Field to provide uh, food to the community. This is uh, a food basket to the surrounding communities. So the aim of this uh, farm, it is to provide the quality food and solve uh, the hunger problem to the surrounding communities. Currently, the church rents a big portion of the land to community members, which helps their livelihood. There are 13 workers to maintain the farm. The plan to use this farm as a training center is well accepted by the local church and the management of this farm, as well as the community. But when the church manages to establish um, a research center or a, an institution which can train people in skills and also um, give hands-on knowledge, I think it will be an ideal and also an answer to the church first and also to the community at large. So whenever we bring the youth of the church can be trained and get the skills to go and advance the mission with the self-support skills that they will have gained from this place. Your 13th Sabbath offering will help build this training center. The church is excited to train and equip more youth who can go out to preach the gospel and support themselves to disciple others. Please pray for this project, especially the students that are coming to this training center. Thank you for supporting the Satini Sabbath mission offering in this place.
you speak. A hundred billion creatures catch your breath. Evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature so
will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. That old rugged cross So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left his glory above To bear it to dark Calvary so I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown theme earth and heaven will pass away it's not a dream God will make all things new that day gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell Evil is banished to eternal hell. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never come. Yes. 
all around. Now the nations bow down to sing. The only sound is the praises to Christ, our King. Slowly the names from the book. Crying again. 
you for that. Uh, good morning, church. I'm going to do things a little bit different today. I am not going to be on the stage. I'm going to be down here talking to you guys. We're going to have a little one-on-one -on -one session today. So, because that's how it's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to come through and fellowship, sorry, like Jesus did with his disciples. We're just a family sitting together having a good time. So that's what we're going to do today. So I won't be on the stage. I'll be down here. Also, because when I used to do presentations for AY, I would always come down here and just like to view better. <laughs> so bear with me for a second. While they get my presentation ready, just want to say thank you to everybody who was performing today, for everybody who participated. Uh, it was a beautiful service. I mean, if we were to end it right here, I think we would all be blessed. So thank you for everybody. All right. uh, this is not my presentation, but this is important. That's a short story I want to share with you guys. Uh, about a year or so ago, I went to a concert, a Christian concert, and different performers were coming up on stage. Uh, they had a presentation, you know, on the backboard, and they would show, like, you know, their upcoming albums, different contact information and stuff. Well, one, person, one performer came up, and on his presentation, it just said Jesus. So people were like, okay, you know, it's a Christian concert, that's fine. But then he went to explain, like, he said, before I came up, they asked me, what did I want to show? You know, do I want to show an album? Do I want to show my, my Instagram or whatever? And he said, no, I want to show the name Jesus, because that is the most important thing. And no matter what happens tonight, that's what I want people to remember. And I remember that, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Just something so simple, just Jesus. So simple, but yet so powerful. So today, regardless of what happens, regardless of what you remember, regardless of what happens through my presentation, just remember the name Jesus because that is the most important thing. And that's what this is all about. So let's say a word of prayer and then we will, we will begin. Is this working with me today? Take a look at this. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for your son. We want to say thank you for the blessings, for the mercy, for the gifts, for fellowship. Lord, we could go on and on, but we just want to say thank you that we are here today. We ask for your presence to be with us as we come together for a while to just talk about you and to think about you. And may everything we do and say be to give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. Love is a verb. Today is Global Youth Day, March 18, 2023. And the topic they have picked is love is a verb. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about love. And a verb, I'm sure all of you know, is an action word. It's something you do. Love is not just something you say. You don't just say, I love you. You show it in the things you do and the things you say, how you respond to situations. So love is a verb. Love is an action. Uh, before we start, there was a small video presentation that they did send that I want to share with you guys. From preschool to graduate school, young people are called to prove that love is not just an emotion, but a call to action. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do as I've commanded. And hasn't he commanded us to love one another? So on March 18, 2023, show the world that love is a verb. Amen. So all over the world, all over the country today, Pathfinders youth are all going out to show to the world that love is a verb and love is what we do. So just something to remember as we leave here today that we should always be showing love to people. So. So love is a verb. Love is something we do. And today I want to talk about two parts, two aspects of love. Part one and part two, you get both today. You don't have to come back next week. Part one, love is sacrifice. Have you ever heard the story of the king and the peasant? It is said that there was a king who was very much in love with a humble woman who lived in a small poor village in his kingdom. The king was not exactly known for being kind, rather he had a reputation of being a monarch. He would not hesitate to humiliate anyone who did not agree with him. However, he felt love for this girl and that brought out his human side. One day, the king thought of declaring his love to this peasant girl. He thought of taking her to his palace. 
He thought of dressing her in beautiful clothes and fine jewelry. How could she refuse his proposal then? He's the king, after all. However, just as he was about to put his plan into action, he asked himself, will she love me? He realized that her going to the palace out of duty or, taking, or him taking her there by force did not guarantee that she would ever love him. Then he thought, maybe there's a different way to go about this. Maybe I'll go to the village on my regal horses, surrounded by my guards. The girl would definitely be overwhelmed by my magnificent glory. He would take her back to his palace and make her his equal. But then he thought again, would she really love me? Finally, the king chose a third option. This time, he would not elevate the maiden, neither would he oppress her. This time, he would choose to descend to the status of the girl. He would make his status equal to hers. He would dress as if he were a beggar, acquire the identity other than his glory, and renounce his throne to win the love of a girl. This story illustrates one great truth, and that's that love requires sacrifice. The Apostle Paul tells a story of a king who was willing to sacrifice everything to regain the love of his subjects. In the second letter of Corinthians, he relates these words. The greatest love story that was ever written. It says, you know our Lord Jesus Christ treated us with undeserved grace by giving up all his riches so we could become rich. There's so much we can mention about the wonderful story of love and sacrifice starring our Lord and Savior Jesus However, today we're going to focus on just two points, two simple truths. The first one being that their king was rich. Every year, Forbes magazine gives out a list of the most rich people in the world. It's called the Top 100 List. It gives out a list of all the billionaires. 2002, the magazine found that there were 2,668 billionaires in the world. And did you know how much money that all these billionaires had if you put it together. And if you just saw my slide by accident, then you would know. It was $12.7 trillion, which for those of you who don't know, is 12.7 with 11 zeros and much more money than I'll ever see in my lifetime. Some of these billionaires include people like Elon Musk, who's the owner of Tesla, and his worth $219 billion. Some other people who were on the list are Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, with his fortune of one of one seven hundred and seventy-one, sorry, billion dollars. Warren Buffett, one hundred eighteen billion dollars, and Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, one hundred and twenty-nine billion dollars. However, although these people mentioned have billions of dollars in their states, their riches are insignificant compared to the riches of our King and Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Heavenly Father, is rich in power and glory. Notice what Paul says in Colossians 1, verse 16, when speaking to the saints. He says, for in him we were created, in him, sorry, were all things created, those in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, be thrones, dominion, principalities, powers, everything was created through him and for him. Our King is the creator of all things. He created the universe and all the galaxies. He created the sun, the moon, millions of stars. He created the sea and all the varieties of fish. All things we see testify of the power and glory of God. Our king, for this reason, I'm sorry, for this reason, heavenly beings never tire of saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessings and glory. Jesus, the Heavenly Father, was, is, and will always be rich in majesty, power, and authority. His riches are countless, and his resources are limitless. Second point, Jesus became poor. In 2017, an Australian NGO called Fund for Peace made a list of the 100 poorest people in the world. In contrast, to the 100 richest people in the Forbes magazine. In first place, there was a woman in a Sudanese refugee camp named Mary, who is a single mother and lives with five children. Second place went to a man named Prim. 
A 45-year-old Nepal man who works 10 hours a day carrying bricks, carrying a basket full of bricks, for which he receives only $4 a day. He lives in a hut with his wife and three children, and his only material possessions are his wristwatch, his clothes, and the basket he uses to carry his bricks. Hearing of this extreme poverty might fill your heart with pain, but did you know that our King Jesus was even poorer than Mary or Prim? How poor did Jesus become? We can find that for ourselves if we read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, but taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Our king became poor. He gave up the worship of heavenly host. He left hallelujahs of the heavenly world to be born in a manger in Bethlehem. He left his power and glory to put on the cloak of extreme poverty and to the cross. What moved our king to such a sacrifice? Could it be his love for us? Yes. Jesus, our heavenly father, became poor for us that we may experience riches. Sacrificing for the well-being of the ones you love, that is what it means to have love. So love is sacrifice. Love is giving up something that you really want for the sake of someone else. Love is putting out the effort to make somebody else feel better, even if it means making yourself feel a little worse. And that's what we do every time we show love to someone. We give a little bit of ourselves. But now let's look on the other end. What does it mean when someone is showing love to you? Love is trust. Have you ever heard the story of the tightrope walker who crossed Niagara Falls, walking on a rope. After keeping the crowd fascinated with his recklessness, he asked, how many of you think I could cross the rope again, but this time holding a wheelbarrow with somebody sitting in it? The crowd applauded. Sure, he would be able to do it. But then the tightrope walker asked, who volunteers to sit in the wheelbarrow? There was a deep silence in the crowd. The crowd had just been faced with a vital difference between believing and trusting. It is one thing to believe that the wheelbarrow would cross safely over the abyss, but to actually place your life in the wheelbarrow and on the rope is something entirely different. These days, we are experiencing what some people have called a crisis of confidence. According to an article published in the Washington Post titled, Millennials Don't Trust Anymore, and That's a Big Deal, a survey of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University states that among millennials, which is those from, 20, from 18 to 29, there is a lack of trust in government, Supreme Courts, media, etc. The article further states that society-wide, trust in institutions is at a near or all-time low. The Bible addresses this issue of trust in God in a very interesting way. It is very interesting to know that there are three words that describe this relationship of dependence that exists between Christians and God, and that is faith, belief, and trust. But the word trust, that best describes the biblical meaning of dependence on God. For example, whenever the word belief or faith appears in the scriptures, they could be replaced by the word trust. The Bible says in Acts 16, verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But it could also read, trust in the Lord Jesus and you could be saved. Amen. Now, why is trust so important? The Bible says in Hebrews, 16 verse, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have to believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You may be wondering right now, what does it mean to trust God? It literally means having a sure expectation that he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he's going to do. 
In the Bible, we find several stories of people who place their entire trust in God. One of these stories being in Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13. This particular account says that on one occasion, a high-ranking Roman officer approached Jesus. Begging him, he said, Lord, my servant is at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Seeing the sensitivity in the heart of the soldier, the Lord answered, I will come and I will heal him. It was then the soldier expressed a degree of confidence that had never before been seen. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I said to you, I have not found such, faith, such great faith even in all of Israel. The Roman soldier trusted the powerful words of Jesus. He blindly believed that the word that the teacher, that the word of the teacher was so powerful it could do miracles. I wish we had the same faith and confidence as the Roman soldier. I wish that we could trust God's word and trust the power that he will do what he says he will do. This is why it is so important that when God tells us to rise, we do so. When he tells us we've been forgiven, we let, us, we let our guilt go. When he tells us how much we are worth, we believe him. And when he says we are saved, we let go of the fear that has been holding us down. However, we cannot fully trust God and his word if we do not love him. To come to love God is essential. To come to love God, it is essential that you know him. John's gospel says, this is eternal life, that you may know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Trust is the result of love. And love grows through a relationship of friendship with God. If you want to trust, if you want your trust to be strong in the Lord, you must establish a relationship with him. You have to talk to him through prayer. Listen to his voice through reading the Bible. Only in this way will you deepen your love for him, and only in this way will your trust for him grow even more. Now I ask you this, how will you respond to such love? The best answer you can give is surrendering your life to Christ. It's sacrificing yourself each day for his love. Remember that true love comes with sacrifice. In the face of in the face of our king's great sacrifice, you and I must be willing to drop everything, sacrifice everything, and give it all out of love for him. And today I invite you to surrender your life to our Heavenly Father out of love for him. Because God's love is the only thing that gets us through. When we go throughout our day and we're facing struggles, when we live our lives and we come across shortcomings, we come across bills that can't be paid, we come across friends and family who are sick and suffering, the only thing we can turn to is Jesus, and we trust in him that his love will see us through. So today, I ask that you go forward keeping that in mind, that you keep in mind Jesus and his love that he has for us. You keep in mind the sacrifice that he has done for us, and that every day, you'll be willing to return that favor, sacrifice yourselves to help others, and that together we will all grow in trust in Jesus. Amen. Well, we thank uh, Brother John Grandison for that powerful presentation. So to close our service today, we're going to sing that song, 190. Jesus loves me, this I know. Let's all stand. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus.
Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, he will wash away my sin, let this little child come in, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you die for me, I will love and live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we've been able to Spend in your presence today. Jesus, we know it's so simple. Jesus loves me, this I know. But yet there's so much power in those simple words. And we ask that we will never forget the love that you have for us, God. And that we will never miss the opportunity to share that love with others, God. Maybe we, may we be willing to sacrifice ourselves each day for someone else. Maybe we, may we be willing to grant them the love that you've shown us. And as we continue to grow and put our faith in you, we ask that we'll all be drawn closer to you until you come again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Amen. God bless you. We have lunch for you today on the other side. So I was asked to say grace. May the Lord bless the meal that was provided. May the good to our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And as we leave, I want to remind us that next Sabbath, we're going to launch Pathfinders and Adventurers. So come out, bring your little ones, come prepared to stay after church for Pathfinders and Adventurers. God bless you as you go. <laughs>